Hi everybody. Uh, this evening I'm going to talk about the founding fathers, uh, particularly two that are in my family tree. The first is John Dickinson. He was the penman of the revolution and you'll see about him. Um, then John Paul Jones, he was the founding father of the American Navy. And, uh, you know, he was, according to the British, he was a pirate. <laughs> he was not well liked by the British because he used to give them hell. And in fact, this gets into, you know, my capacity building efforts and, and work that John Paul Jones, I mean, he had, you know, he didn't have the best ships and uh, they were tiny. I mean, he was up against the British Navy that, that was, was the fear of the seas. And he won. They, they were afraid of him. And the people on the coast, the English coast as well, were afraid of him. And uh, the reason that he was able to wreak havoc and, and so successful was that he was, you know, small and, and, and could maneuver. And, and the big, big British with antiquated British cronyism. I mean, this you saw as well in the, the, the colonies uh, during the war. One of the reasons that they also won was that there was a bunch of idiots uh, in, in the, the British um, military. And how do they get that way? Well, they get there by cronyism and they wake their way up and, and, and they create havoc. And, and the more, the bigger and more bureaucratic an organization or a country becomes or an empire, the worse it's going to get. Uh, and, and the longer it goes on, the more, how shall I say, institutionalized it is. And that's what we're seeing in the United States. I don't care if I go up to Capitol Hill, to the courthouse here, to IMF, to World Bank, to uh, White House, State Department, the restaurants, it doesn't matter where you go. It, 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 it's the same, same. The, 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 the crazies have taken over. <laughs> Remember the zombies, um, Michael Jackson's movie, the, the thriller with the zombies. That's what, that's what working in Washington is like. And, and, and the monster, the werewolves that come out, the managers. So anyway, I'm going to start um, with we the people, the modern day figures who have reshaped and affirmed the Founding Fathers' vision of America by Juan Williams. Uh, he's on Fox News, The Five. Oh, Lord. <laughs> I mean, he, he, he's the liberal, and quite frankly, he's, he's one of the few who uh, speaks with any kind of sanity. There's another guy, I can't I forget names, I'm not very good, Gottfeld or something like that. Juan Williams is on the left, and this other guy is on the other extreme right. <sighs> oh, God. <laughs> I don't know anybody can put that man on TV and on a news show to boot. I mean, it, it, these guys are just as bad as The View with Whoopi Goldberg. There's um, John McCain's daughter. I forget the, 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 the women on there. But that that's that's the juxtapox. <laughs> they're the same. They're the same. I promise you, this country has really gone crazy. Really, really. It was pretty bad when I left in the 80s. But, uh, it just keeps on going down, 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 down. So, uh, oh, and then the photos that Juan Williams. This, I don't agree with. There's, okay, George Washington. Yeah, okay, fine. Then Martin Luther King, of course. Uh, Ronald Reagan. I mean, Ronald Reagan is the one, well, is more Nancy Reagan. It's more her fault. I mean, we'll see that later as well when I get into Nancy Reagan and 
and the whole Reagan era. Uh, and Hillary Clinton. I mean, I was only out there, vote Hillary Clinton, vote Hillary Clinton in 2016 and campaigning like crazy um, because I knew what would happen if Trump got in. Hold everybody and I'm telling everybody where this is gonna go and I hope everybody will listen to me I mean I'm not always right Some people, oh, always thinking, no I'm not always right but when I do my homework I'm never wrong unless I ha I'm missing some facts but really when I have all of the information, this is one of the problems with the courts, with the economists, with, with all the social science. Uh, you know, the people in there, they don't know how to examine evidence and, and, and arrive at a logical, objective conclusion. I mean, I, I guess part of what's helped me is living abroad for so many years uh, was for 20 I'm 57 I mean uh, when I came back 10 years ago I had half my life had been lived in the States and half uh, outside and one of the things that I remember back uh, this is actually would have been the nine it would have been 1990 because I was in Spain and you know by this time I'm understanding French pretty good. Uh, well, I mean, understanding, yeah, French and Spanish. So my speaking is still rudimentary. Um, but I'm listening to the, the news on, you know, whether it's French, Spanish, American, British, uh, or reading it from anywhere I can get, because back in those days we didn't have this. I mean, my lord, all of you people who live abroad nowadays, we used to, to we could get a, a, a oh gosh, a, uh, a newspaper in English, oh, that was, that was a gold mine. Um, I mean, it's good, you have to read, when you're in a country, read, read, read everything that you can. Simple magazines, that's simple and that's the best. And listen, listen, listen. But I will tell you, on occasions you like to sit down and be able to read something that you understand in its entirety. Anyway, uh, from We the People. So how long ago and far away is the America of 1776? How distant is the Founding Fathers America from the reality of 21st century America? I can only imagine how different the people I met while working on that show would be if I reconnected with them today. Imagine the dizziness the Founding Fathers would experience. The NPR series won critical acclaim. He's talking about the changing faces of America uh, by Buckminster Fuller and Ray Kurzweil. Uh, these stories of change in American life from east to west, from urban to rural, and among young and old reminded me that American life was being transformed in exponential leaps. As a journalist, I was particularly alert to the new reality of fragments of politics and niche media. Yes. I mean, the, the, the media outlets are nothing but entertainment centers. Experiences that at one time served to unify large segments of the population, such as watching one of the three network evening news programs, began to dissolve. With audiences for news programs breaking into politically separate groups, listening to their preferred views on talk radio, or watching politically titled cable news shows, like The Five and The View and, and so many other it just it, it really is tiring and it's 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 obscene because they're propaganda machines they're not you know news informers and everybody wants to be a star and everybody wants to, to be on TV 
Even the surge of American nationalism following the 9-11 attacks and the decision to go into two wars faded quickly. At first, flags flew everywhere and people stood to applaud the troops at sporting events. But as time passed, the wars didn't feel so real anymore. No one was drafted. College campus protests like those that emerged in opposition to the war in Vietnam never took place because the professional force fighting the war and dying generally did not come from elite colleges or colleges at all for that matter. Um, yeah, he's right. You know, we, we, all of the, the, the ruling elite produces all of these wars and then it's the poor people who go and put their lives on the line. And then they come back, oh Lord, <laughs> and treat it, treat it as bad as the, the, the deposed trophy wives and, and, and you know, stay-at-home moms trying to opt back in. Uh, <laughs> When I, in 2016, when I was campaigning, there was this uh, gentleman, he sold on the streets the, the caps and, you know, those little uh, trolleys and carts. And he was a vet. I mean, I was like, Lord, this man is in the wrong business. He, uh, I was like, got to get him up on a stage. He was a comedian and he was going on about the vets. And... <laughs> How they want to dope you up and and how they're crazy he wasn't the one who was crazy the people who were crazy are the people over at the vets uh taking care of these poor people i mean they've got trauma this is also I'll get into another time daniel amen um his book and about the the, the brain and how trauma affects the brain and, yeah, it's traumatic. <laughs> kind of traumatic having bombs thrown at you. And, and, and uh, what I was going through in 2008 when they were trying to kill me, all my lawyers, and destroy me, I, I was like, oh my God, the bombs are going off everywhere. They're silent. Nobody can see them, but they're going off. And, and I'm no different than a soldier uh, who's afraid for his life. And, and it is very, very traumatic on the brain. And believe me, you people, if you don't start moving and you're, you're the 10 percenters, your neighborhoods start getting raped and pillaged, you'll know what we're all talking about. Okay, where was I? Um, even the search... Oh, no, that no, no, no. Similarly, the once widespread trust in institutions began to slide. The public school suffered because of poor performance, the Catholic Church because of pedophile scandals. Oh, same thing in family courts. The, the activists, they equate this with the cover-up of the pedophile in the Catholic Church, and they're right. It's just we haven't yet gotten, I, I know, some of them, I think, contacted the guys at the Globe. I believe it was the Boston Globe who broke that. It, I mean, it'll come. It'll come someday. Uh, it's just, in the meantime, how many children are suffering? How many women and children are suffering? I mean, we'll see this later. The animal rights people. <sighs> women are going to the courts using animal legislation and laws to protect animals because they have better laws than we do for our children this is a this is these are our priorities in society it's not just the Americans everybody's going down the same road <sighs> baseball stars found themselves before Congress accused of cheating with performance enhancing steroids money 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 our confidence in the goodwill of Wall Street bankers and other financial leaders eroded. I wonder why. Trust in the word of government officials fell when people found out they had been misled about the presence of weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. 
and later when the government was shown to have been asleep at the switch when the economic crash came in 2008. Yeah, well, I remember, because I have to say, I was in favor of the invasion of Iraq, and it was more from the reports of the UN confirming basically what the Americans wanted them to say uh, than, than, than what my government was saying. Um, and that it was actually in 2008 that that book got left in Madrid that I was reading. I mean, it was such a nightmare that year, so I don't remember all of the book. But um, I don't like to read it again, but you know how that was just a, a another UN Bretton Woods sell out and how they're in bed with the Americans. We see it. This is my big beef with the IMF. I mean, my letter, I, I don't know. Maybe if I write pig Latin to these people, they'll start being able to read. I mean, I really have always been very good, very, very good from a young age of organizing, explaining things, and I know they're very, very long, because I've gotten to the point, I'm like, oh, well, if you're not going to read them anyway, then I'll just have them here for posterity, and we can see this in the Nuremberg trials too, and then you can explain it to them. I mean, I don't care that nobody's reading them. They've been served. They have the information. If they're too stupid to look at what they're, what they're taking on, that's their problem. I mean, really, it gets to the point where enough is enough. Come on, you guys. The whole world is not stupid. You guys are the ones that are stupid. Uh, and, and uh, the economic crash of 2008. We're, we're going down that road again. As a black man, I was particularly struck, and this time, there, there's nothing. As I, I said, they've used up their little bag of tricks. Oh my God, they injected more money, more money, more money. At one, at some point, somebody's going to say enough. As a black man, I was particularly struck that the once reliable framework of racial identity in America, white majority and black minority dealing with the aftermath of slavery and legal segregation began to blur as Latinos and Asians began to exercise new cultural and economic influence on the nation. For the next few years, um, I continued filing away stories that fit the pattern of these foundational shifts in American life. I wanted to weave this collection of wonderful threads into a vivid tapestry that revealed the new look of modern American life. What became clear to me was that America was engaged in a new beginning. This was not the country where I grew up. America has been reborn any number of times over the course of its existence. The westward expansion of the Civil War, the New Deal, all had their turn at reinventing the country. Here at the beginning of the 21st century, I found myself looking at one of the most of those extraordinary moments of natural, national transformation. <clears throat> a new America had emerged, at times painfully bursting from past realities and shedding cultural norms as it entered stage after stage of uncertain change. To me, this radical transformation was something to celebrate. Yes, political polarization and fear of rapid change were making people anxious. But overall, middle class Americans continued to enjoy a high standard of living compared to other people around the globe. Yes, because we're the vampires. I mean, this is the high income countries just like the empire builders, the British, the Spanish, the Belgian, the, the, the French, all the Europeans, it was a predatory globalization. And it exploited, and that's way, why you ended up with these countries being third world countries. And then we go, oh, uh, 
Wolfeson at the World Bank. I think he was really the one who started yeah, getting rid of poverty. So we're going to lift the poor countries out of poverty, which is fine. But they're not doing it in a sustainable manner. They're doing it following the model of the dysfunctional Americans and just inviting everybody. That's why we've got the, the, the new empire builders vying for world dominance, which is going to end up in a war. The Brazilians, the Indians, the Chinese, uh, the Russians, and the Americans with the Europeans. So it'll end up in another war. Just because all, and this is, this is the thing, politics. Politics is about their little games. Politics, uh, I looked it up, I forget who came up with the word originally, but it was affairs of the state, not extramarital affairs of those within the state. I mean, it just, it, it, it's, it's, it, it, it's a frat house, and everybody's screwing around and, and playing around. Oh, God. Juan Williams came in to, to Kalari. And, and I didn't know he, who he was at the time, but Rita, the manager, she did. And he, he, he called me over. He's like, oh, is that a ring on your left uh, hand? Is that a wedding ring? I'm like, and I'm trying to talk to him about the book. Because, of course, anytime anybody would come in, who is it? Well, then I Google the person and find out who they are and, and the whole, I mean, one of the reasons why I'm working at Kalari is you got all of these VIPs coming in there. So I do the whole schmooze and cruise. Instead of being invited to the cocktail parties, I do it as the host is there. I don't care where I do it, you know. This is something that, that all of these networking people and, and socialite wannabes are not understanding. It's not just about getting to the parties and you know, ugh. hello with the you know the cocktail and the whole bit and the, the 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 whole schmoozing. It's about meeting people, finding out who people are in the community. I mean, as an expat, you're constantly having to do that, and as the trailing spouse, particularly, and. Particularly when we were in Bogota, I had to do that amongst the Hispanophones, the Francophones, and the Anglophones. And one, uh, this was when I was coming in as president of the Bogota K, the French Expat Association, and it was one of these coffee mornings. And the coffee mornings are very good, but it, it, the expat associations have to be something more than just coffee mornings and cocktail parties. And um, a newcomer, she came over to me and she said, oh, somebody told me to come over and ask you because uh, you know who everybody is and where everything is in this city. <laughs> I laughed under my breath. I said, sure, what do you want to know? Well, you know? I laughed under my breath and I said, oh, God, I don't think the person who said that about me <laughs> meant it as a compliment. <laughs> Because the Spanish expat wives from BBDA couldn't stand me. I mean, these women just hated me, hated me. And uh, I mean, this, this was not paranoia. Believe me, the, the, the Spaniards who were living there at the time can can confirm this. And uh, I mean, one of the Spaniards, when I first got there, they said, "Oh, stay away from that organization. It's just filled with the most riperous uh, women." but <laughs> from my husband's company. Um, but uh, they hated me because I had to always be doing something. I was like, God, anytime I hear that, I'm like, you know what? Go and get a life. If you were worrying, if you, you know, bother, wasting your energy on hating somebody because they have to always be doing something, he got a pretty pathetic life, <laughs> really, and, and narcissistic, and, and we'll see with Daniel Amen how it atrophies the, the, the mind. <sighs> that is one thing that my, my mother was always right about, <sighs> you know, intellectual curiosity. 
people who just read something so they can get the A or get the paycheck but have absolutely no interest and no understanding about their reading what they're reading drives me crazy uh let's see let's see I forget what I was what became clear to me was that America was engaged in a new beginning this was not the country where I grew up America has been reborn any number of times over the course of its existence the Western expansion the Civil War the New Deal all had their turn at reinventing the country here at the beginning of the 21st century I found myself looking at one of those extraordinary moments of national transformation a new America had emerged at times painfully bursting from past realities and shedding cultural norms as it entered stage after stage of uncertain change. To me this radical transformation was something to celebrate. Yes, political polarization and fear of rapid change were making people anxious. Oh, I guess I already read this, but overall uh, Americans can continue a high standard of living compared to other people around the globe. Okay, here is where I left off. Plus, the policies that force people of color and women into subversive, subversive sense, what is this, subversive sense, have all but vanished. And we Americans have a chance to create, like artists with an untouched, untouched canvas, a new, potentially better reality for ourselves. Uh... In this transformed 21st century America, women are now earning the majority of both undergraduate and graduate degrees. One college administrator joked with me that if their admissions panel went strictly on test scores, writing samples, and extracurricular activities, their entire student body would consist of women. He went on to say, only half joking, that they had to have a, an affirmative action program for young men. When I asked him what, why that, when I asked him why that was, he said, "Because girls like boys." Women now make up roughly half of the American workforce. There are a record number of women and minorities serving as CEOs of Fortune 500 companies. Educated young women were the swing vote in the 2008, 2010, and 2012 elections. Those women, along with older women who are widowed, divorced, and or never married, have become the deciding vote in every election since the early 1970s. Election cycle trying to appeal to women with a special emphasis on independent-minded working women dubbed soccer moms during the economic boom of the 1990s, security moms, after 9-11 or mortgage moms after the 2008 financial collapse. They are highly likely to vote because they care about how government impacts the way their families live. Yes, unfortunately, you know, women, they're not, they're more concerned about their families and their, their, you know, their lives and their daily lives than about the governing of the country. I mean, th this is one of the reasons why women have traditionally been kept out of politics. I mean, I know women are always, you know, like, shut up, Wimby. They don't understand what I'm talking about. That's, uh, as I said in another presentation, I've always preferred the company of men uh, for, for, for discourse because women is shopping, oh God, oh, I can't stand, I, I, anytime I have to go shopping, I'm going along. I, I mean, okay, I might go with a, a gay friend, <laughs> and that's okay, but no women. Oh no, oh no, 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 they drive me crazy. This shift in the national conversation left the older white and conservative center of political life with its intense focus on a strong military, low taxes, deregulation, and small government. 
increasingly out of touch and concerned that this political and demographic change signals the passing of the true America. It stirred nostalgia. Excuse me. It stirred nostalgia for the past, beginning with the Founding Fathers and the Constitution. It created yearning for the 1950s, an era before anti-war protest. The civil rights movement, feminism, and new types of immigrants had destroyed the faith in capitalism, democracy, and the traditional family that Americans once held so dear. Um, you know, there's so much propaganda and, and fallacies. One time my father told me is that one of the problems is not only debunking the the fallacies and the errors that are being made now, it's that they were built upon, you know, fallacies or errors or the feminist uh, BS decades and decades ago. And people have built upon it. So you got to dismantle the, 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 the entire house of cards instead of piecemeal approach and 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 you gotta rebuild a whole new one so anyway that's one Williams let me play you this is John Dickinson oh, it's getting late so I think I'm gonna do this in, in two parts The reason John Dickinson is not a household name is really only because he refused to sign the Declaration of Independence. But Dickinson actually fulfilled a vitally important role. He had a vision for the country that nobody else had yet, a unified people with a constitution that would be amendable so that we would never need a revolution again. Dickinson has a message for us that is one of cohesion, unity, peace, civil discourse, not just about our institutions, but also in how we discourse with one another. These are lessons that we can learn today. I mean, this is what I'm trying to do. Basically, I, I do vindicate him. John Dickinson him. was born in Talbot County on Maryland's eastern shore on November 2nd, 1732. His father, Samuel Dickinson, was a wealthy landowner, lawyer, and judge. Samuel was in the third generation of a family of tobacco planters who, with the help of slave labor, grew a prosperous business. Following the death of his first wife, Samuel remarried and had two sons, John and Philemon. In 1740, he and his wife Mary moved their family to Kent County, Delaware. It was here, at the Jones Neck Plantation adjacent to the river, that young John grew up. John Dickinson's ancestors came over initially as indentured servants on his father's side. 